Have you ever had something really bad happen? And you wonder to yourself, how could God let this happen? Why is this happening? Or maybe you think, I can't handle this. You ever thought that one? I just can't handle what's happening right now. I just, I, I, yeah, I just can't handle it. I'm just overwhelmed. What do we do when we feel overwhelmed? What do we do? We get through it. We let ourselves feel it, and we get through it. We know the feeling isn't permanent when we're going through something. That is a great reminder. What do, what do a lot of people say? This too shall pass. One day at a time. Those slogans are uh, sometimes a little annoying when someone repeats them you know, over and over, but they're also true, aren't they? We know this isn't permanent, it's temporary. But we might be tempted to ask the question, why God? Why me? Why me, right? Maybe a better question is, why not me? Why not me? We all go through hard times. That's part of life. That's part of how the fallen earth is right now. There's problems, there's issues. Particularly for Christians, we go through trials to test and build our faith in him. But we may be tempted to start arguing with God. What if instead we trusted him? Instead of starting to ask those questions, maybe instead, or at least after we ask, we can finally say, I don't understand. I, I came across that scripture recently where Israel's praying and they say, we, we, don't, we don't know what to do, God, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And that's a great thing to have as a Christian to turn to someone of the world who does not believe in God or Jesus they can't say that. They stop at, I don't know what to do. And, I, and I, I know I've said this before, but I think that's why a lot of people during COVID panicked to a, a kind of panic level that was unseen. They were hysterical because they couldn't say, our eyes are on you, God. They said, they, they knew through and through that they were alone and they didn't have anyone to turn to. That's a scary place to be, but as Christians, we know that's false. That is not true. What's true is we have a God who is greater and in charge. And when I don't know what to do, my, I, can, I, can, I can know, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I choose to trust you, God. That's hard. It's very important, though, because God wants us to learn to trust him more and more despite our circumstances. That's huge for a Christian. God is teaching you that, to trust thoroughly and fully in him when things are going crazy around you or even inside you, to trust him in the storm, to rest in that trust, a total trust in God. A lot of the things we go through are teaching us that simple, profound fact Trust in him no matter what. Hold that spot of trust. Stay in that spot of trust. We've seen that situation again and again for David, who is on the run at this point, yes? He is on the run. Remember, 600 guys he's got with him. He's got kind of this band of outcasts around him, and he's on the run, fleeing from King Saul. David could have said, Lord, why? I was supposed to be king, but instead I'm on the run. Instead... David trusted God. David also wrestled with God in the Psalms, though, didn't he? Obviously, there was some wrestling going on where he was wrestling with God, struggling with God, struggling to understand why things were happening the way that they were. But he kept trusting. He didn't give up either. That's a battle, I think, that we as Christians will have to learn how to fight. We wrestle with God as Christians, with questions and fears and emotions, with sins, and the goal in all that, I think, is to wrestle, but to stay with God in the wrestling. Sometimes we wrestle and wonder and ask questions, but the idea we, is we need to stay with God as we wrestle. Sometimes we're tempted to run away from God when we wrestle, but if we do wrestle with God, stay with him in the wrestling. Stick with him, say, you know what? I don't get it, I'm still here, though. I'm still with him. 
keep running toward God. We've spent, many in here have spent our lives running away from things, running away from our problems, running away from people, but now with God, let's run toward him, not away. If you recall, David and his 600 men were being chased by King Saul's army, but at the last moment, Saul was called away due to a Philistine attack on Israel. Remember, David and his group of 600 guys were on one side of the mountain, Saul's troops were on the other side, and Saul was just about to catch him, and he finds out that the Philistines are attacking, so he has to leave. After, the, after fighting the Philistines off, Saul goes to work again. He says in, it says in 1 Samuel 24, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Chelsea, our program coordinator, was telling me about how beautiful En Gedi is. She's been there. Chelsea visited Israel, and she's been to this oasis called En Gedi. It, it, it exists in a desert, but it is this very beautiful oasis. If you Google pictures of it, you'll see that it's this barren desert, but then in the midst of it is this beautiful waterfall, this beautiful sort of oasis, where I'm sure David and his men visited and refreshed themselves. It's important to remember that these aren't just stories about David and Saul. These are historical events at real places, places you can visit even today. You can see where these things happen in Israel. Someday I want to go there. Yes. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak to us through this message, God. Help us to see these events as true, historical, real, not just old stories, God. I yield to your leading in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 3, it says, Saul came to the sheep pens. Along the way, a cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. But he didn't realize David and his men were far back in the cave. So <laughs> Saul and his men, he, he sent his men forward. They're going off in all directions. There's 3,000 of them looking for David and his troops. Meanwhile, Saul wanders over to this cave to use the bathroom. And who's in the cave? David and his men. They're hiding in this vast labyrinth of caves. And Saul happens to go in there to use the bathroom. Think about that. What are the chances of that? That's crazy. But I, I, I wrote that down. What are the chances of that? But then I thought to myself, what are the chances of any of us being here today at all? Not very good for some of us. I mean, I, I, I know most of your stories here. A lot of us, it's, pre, it's a miracle to just say that we, we're still alive. So what are the chances? Well, our God is a God of the impossible. So he, 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 he lines things up in a particular way. And it's, it, it's amazing, but He sets things up just right for the right moment to happen. This is one of those uh, events in David's life that is remembered throughout history. Something pretty incredible. But God lines things up just right, doesn't he? Here on planet Earth, it's pretty solid. The Earth is just the right distance from the sun we were a little closer, we'd burn up. We'd all be on fire. If we were a little further away, we'd all be frozen. If the moon wasn't right there to stabilize our orbit, there would be improper seasons, we would all die. If Jupiter wasn't there to absorb incoming asteroids, the surface of Earth would be pummeled by asteroids and there'd be no life. Jupiter, moon, Earth, distance, sun, it's all just right to allow for us to be here today. Lucky us, huh? Some people think that. It's just lucky. It's just luck. 
We're just here by accident. We're just walking meat puppets. Yeah, that sounds likely. It all just happened just so. Oh, and by the way, there's a giant ball of fire that we're rotating around. Yeah, it just appeared. Yeah. It just came from nowhere, and it's going nowhere. That, that's logical, right? It didn't really, you know. It just appeared. Just from nothing. Oh, God didn't make anything. No, it just appeared. Yeah, that sounds logical. Because we, we know that something can come from nothing, right? That, that's established. That happens all the time. I mean, stuff just pops into existence, doesn't it? You know? Here's a podium. It wasn't here before. No, wait a minute. It, this has been here for a while, hasn't it? Okay. God made sure we'd have a place to live, a planet. Interesting. And God made sure that David would have this chance to deal with Saul directly. So David's men, when they see Saul, they think this is the perfect opportunity to finally kill Saul. We're going to kill him, they say. Any other person on the planet would think the same thing. I would think that. If I've got this evil king chasing after me, the prophet Samuel has told me, you are going to be king, and God puts him into my hands... God lined it all up, right? But that's not what David thinks. In verse 4, the men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. So apparently David had already been told by God, I'm going to put Saul in your hands for you to deal with as you wish. So it says, Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So how does David deal with this moment where Saul is using the bathroom over there and David creeps up behind him? He uses his sword, he cuts a, a piece of his robe off, and he leaves. It says in verses 5 through 7, afterward, David was conscious, stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him. For he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. David didn't kill Saul, but he's even upset that he cut, cut off a corner of his robe. He's, he's, he has a conscience that is very strong where he says, I can't believe I did that. That, that. that I would even dare to cut a corner of the robe off of the king. How could I do such a thing? How could I do that? This is a man of very strong conscience. He is grief-stricken by the slightest compromise, by the slightest scent of sin in his life. May that be true of us as well here. May we be so sensitive as well and conscience-stricken to any sin in our lives. May we just be troubled by even the scent of it. May we allow our conscience, as well as the Holy Spirit, to convict us of any sin that might be in our lives right now. May we be as ashamed of, as David of any issue like this. So it says in verse 8, Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, he's shocked. He's like, whoa, David's right there. David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. You understand what prostrate means? You lie face down on the ground, like my face on the floor. He goes down before Saul like that. Wow. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. He said, the, the Lord put you right there for me to kill. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. 
As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. David speaks directly to King Saul. And that is a biblical way to deal with hatred, anger, the desire for revenge. You let God deal with it. God will repay, not you. And if that's tough, you re repeat this phrase, the Lord will deal with them. Or you, you, you pray, the Lord will rebuke them. The Lord rebuke you. Ven or repeat this phrase, <clears throat> vengeance belongs to God. Scriptural, vengeance belongs to God. God is the only one qualified to deal out, to deal out judgment. No human has the qualifications for that, only God. You forgive, you pray for them, then God deals with them on his own terms and in his own way. Don't like it that way? Tough, that's how it is. Then David says, verses 14 and 15, against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? He calls himself a flea or a dead dog to Saul, this man pursuing him to kill him. He says, I'm a, I'm a dead dog, I'm a flea. Why, why do you even bother with me? That's how humble David is in this situation. Would any of us be able to say that? About this man trying to ruin our lives. And he says in verse 15, may the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. David publicly declares, God is the judge in this situation. I'm not. God's the judge. I can't judge. Deal with this, God, because neither of us can. David is so humble. He refuses to manipulate events. He allows God to work things out. He invites God to. Can we do the same when we're in a dispute and we're angry at someone? Say, God, I can't judge them. That's on. That's that's you, God. You got to deal with it. I can't. You got to do that, God. Can we let God run our lives in that way? Well, we don't deal out revenge or justice. We leave it to God and say, God, you're the one. And I forgive my enemy. And I pray you'd bless them. That's our job as Christians. When David finished saying this, Saul asked. Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? This is, this is unheard of in history. Unheard of. When a man, Saul says, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. Saul is overcome by, by what's happened. He knows he could have killed me. Easy. And he, he, he even says, I know that you will surely be king. And that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. Saul can so sense in this moment what's really going on. He says, listen, David, I can tell you're going to be king. Please don't harm my family on that day. Wow. And it says David gave his oath. He says, I promise you, Saul, I will not harm your family on that day. This is not easy stuff. This is real stuff. This is Old Testament, too. This is not even Jesus' time yet. yet. Yet David is picturing us this radical forgiveness and love of God. And this radical letting God be the judge, letting vengeance belong to God and not him. It's a big deal. It's hard. It's tough. I don't know that any of us would react this way in this situation. I, I hope we would, but man, that's tough. This says, then Saul returned home, but David and his men went, went up to the stronghold. Saul is astonished. He weeps. He is so amazed by what has just happened. He can tell us where, where this is going. And he lets David go again. So the big question, I think, again, as we conclude today, is, um, okay, we heard this message, right, about David and Saul 
Now, the important part is this. Apply it to your life. Otherwise, if we just heard it, it doesn't really, it goes in one ear, out the other, okay, we heard it. How do, how do we apply this to our lives? That's the, that's the hard part. When you are in an angry dispute with someone, I want you to remember David in the cave as your example of how to deal with that situation. I mean when you're really mad. I mean when you're really, really upset. You think of David and you say, I gotta respond that way. I gotta respond with forgiveness, love, and a willingness to let God deal, be their judge. And to say, I, I refuse to judge them, I refuse to condemn them, I refuse to seek vengeance, I give it to God. So how do we live this? Five principles, very quickly. Don't run away when you're overwhelmed, run toward God. Just like David, time and again, he ran toward God. Run toward him. Two, believe that God will line things up just right. God made the impossible possible. Do you ever think this could have happened by chance? No, God lined this up for this moment to happen. Three, be a man of conscience or a woman of conscience like David. He had a very sensitive conscience to, to doing any sort of wrong. May that be true of us as well. Number four, be incredibly humble. David was so humble. He says, are, are you pursuing a dead dog, a flea? Why does that matter? I don't matter that much, he says, even though, even though he did. We talk about David as, as great, as, as a Christ-like example. Yet he said, I'm a flea. He refused to harm Saul. Number five, let God be the judge. David refused to condemn Saul for his actions. He said, the Lord rebuke you. We must do the same. Refuse to condemn our enemies. Instead, forgive them and pray for them and let God deal with them. Say, you know what? I'm going to leave judgment to God. It's not on me to judge them. I forgive them. Run to God. Believe that God will bring miracles. Be a person of conscience. Be very humble and let God be the judge. That's how we apply this today. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for each person in this room, myself included, God, that you'd bring these thoughts to mind, thoughts from your word, in critical moments when we need them, Father. And help us to apply them to our lives, God, in Jesus' name, amen. And you know, that's who Jesus Christ is. We were all sinners lost in our sins. He could have said, I'm done with you people. You sin, see ya. Instead, he says, I'm going to offer you forgiveness, mercy, new life, and I'm going to welcome you in as an adopted child into my family. That's who Jesus is, praise the Lord.